45. In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. We're uh, studying Matthew chapter 18, verse 7, where it says, Woe to the world because of child abuse. For it is inevitable that child abuse cases occur. But woe to that person through whom the child abuse comes. So the Supreme Court of Heaven never lets a child abuser get away with the abuse. And what we saw after the destruction of New Orleans was a lot of child abuse occurring in the Superdome. And uh, that was part of a natural disaster that occurred in our country. And a lot of these judgments are occurring uh, somewhat related to the fact that there is a tremendous amount of child abuse and we are moving into the uh, the uh, four generation curse. So as long as a person reacts to child abuse, the defense mechanisms will replace any possibility of, of them developing the ten problem solving devices in the soul. And that's because when they use the defense mechanisms it keeps them from rebounding. The uh, abused child often uh, begins to, th to think of themselves as always right and if you're always right there's no need to rebound so they remain outside of fellowship never develop the ten problem solving devices however they still function under the defense mechanisms when they become operational the judgment of child abusers extends throughout society in general and is a one of the major contributing factors to the destruction of a nation child abuse is definitely a major contributing factor to the destruction of a nation. The same scar tissue of the soul that rejects the gospel also reject, rejects any restraint with regard to child abuse. This is for the child abuser and oftentimes they are the most difficult people to witness to because uh, not only through their rejection of the gospel does scar tissue build but through all those times that they have committed child abuse there's been a rampant uh, quick buildup of scar tissue and that's why our Lord says it is better to cut off your hand and be saved than to be a child abuser and not be saved now he doesn't say this in terms of being literal it's a way to shock the child abuser they would never think of chopping off their hand because their hand has offended a young child and so this is a way our Lord shocks them and he's used uh, on different occasions this method of shocking people into realizing how wretched they are it is better to cut off your hand and be saved than to be a child abuser and not be saved. Most child abusers uh, do so from maximum scar tissue in the stream of consciousness. That is, they continue with the child abuse. Therefore, they are the hardest people to evangelize in the world. So it's better to suffer trauma. It's better for you personally to suffer trauma by chopping off your hand than abusing a child. That's what our Lord is saying. It's better to suffer trauma than to have scar tissue or to face the trauma that scar tissue uh, brings to you when you uh, abuse others, especially children. The eye that uh, will be talked about represents the lust pattern of the old sin nature. They have a lust pattern in the old sin nature, uh, most of it related to power lust. <coughs> Excuse me. Any type of uh, child abuse in terms of physical child abuse in which uh, they just uh, beat them half to death would be power lust. Of course, there's sexual lust involved in those instances where there is a, a sexual abuse to the child. Child abuse builds up so much scar tissue uh, that eventually, even if the abuser wishes to be saved, they cannot be saved. They pass the point of no return. 
And oftentimes they've heard the gospel two, three, four, five, maybe maybe more than ten times and re- have rejected it every time and they continue in their uh, child abuse. Therefore, the scar tissue builds up so quickly that even if uh, toward the end of their days uh, they say to themselves, well, now I want to be saved, they can't do it just like Esau and you say well how's that well we all know the story of Esau who wept for salvation but could not receive it because he could not come to faith alone in Christ alone it can happen it's when you've gone past the point of no return as an unsaved person in the same way a saved person can go past the point of no return in which they're they're still going to heaven but they're locked into being a loser and if they are uh, if they've been saved for 40, 30, 40, 50 years and they haven't gotten on doctrine as of yet and if they're in a Pentecostal movement or they're in some other type of uh, movement it's locked in and no matter what you tell them will get them out of that and you'll be the one who's wrong and they'll be the ones who are always right and you can show them scriptures and you can say well the Bible says have the thinking of Christ and Christ didn't run up and down aisles and act like a nut act like a fruitcake a lunatic and uh, I don't say it to be funny, but these people are lunatics when they get involved in the emotional revolt of the soul and move into the Pentecostal, Pentecostal movement. They've lost their minds. They've gone disukas, as James calls it. And they have just simply, uh, there's no hope. Now, if you've uh, been in the Pentecostal movement in the past, and then eventually eventually you get uh, interested in the Word of God, and it doesn't take you 30, 40, 50 years, there's a, a way to recover. But even then, it takes a while. So no child abuser ever gets away from himself. And he never gets away with what he's done because of the law of volitional responsibility. Sowing to the wind and reaping the whirlwind. That's per Hosea 8.7 where you sow to the wind and reap the whirlwind. That is exactly what the child abuser does. So no victim of child abuse could ever punish a parent or child abuser as well as God. So in other words, understand that if you've been abused, God is going to deal with that person. You don't need to have bitterness. Uh, In fact, you don't even really need to uh, run around and tell everybody about it. Uh, you're doing that because you want to destroy that person and uh, now it's different if you're a child and you're being sexually abused and you tell you should tell in those cases but I'm talking about once you're uh, 30 years old and there's the law doesn't touch them after they're 28 by the way not well it's certain laws in certain states that just won't uh, if you've been abused and uh, you were abused when you were 17 18 by your parents and now you're 29 it's too late Nothing the law can do about that. Uh, But before that time, there's something the law can do. And uh, in those cases, it should be done before you even get that old so that the child abuser can be taken out of society so that uh, they don't continue to do this with others. And they will continue. They do not stop. In very rare cases do they ever stop. And they can only stop through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And even then... It takes a long time for them to break that lust pattern, that power lust. It is nearly impossible, but it's happened under God's grace. So you do not need to justify yourself or defend yourself if you've been abused. Always remember that God will handle them. God is going to be the one who's going to bury them in the depths of the sea with a millstone around their neck. And they're going to live miserable lives. And if they're not saved, they're going to die and go to hell and have a miserable eternity. And that's God's punishment uh, in terms of temporary punishment in time. The, of course, going to hell has to do with their rejection of Christ, not with their child abuse. Some child abusers are saved and are going to heaven. So the dynamics of the spiritual life is to have the faith rest drill and and use the flot line of the soul. Use those ten problem-solving devices. Use the two power options. Be filled with God the Holy Spirit and have a daily consistent perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. This is the only way you can drive out the defense mechanisms. It's the only way. If you do not, uh, and oftentimes the abused person who latches on to doctrine uh, really latches on to it because they have so much junk to push out of their souls and it eventuates in them pushing it all out. And then... uh, 
Others who have uh, been abused, uh, there's been some cases where they have uh, latched on to doctrine academically, uh, but they were so wrapped up in self-justification and self-deception and self-absorption and so wrapped up in repression that they would learn these uh, terms out of fellowship and it really has no value to them. And you might talk to them and they might know every uh, uh, term re regarding uh, the theological terms that, uh, that has ever been derived. And then uh, they never apply it. And that happens, of course, as well. Because uh, the defense mechanisms have such a strong hold, but they can be pushed out if you consciously make the choice through your own volition to grow in grace and in knowledge and consciously make the choice not to justify yourself every time you sin and constantly make the choice uh, not to be self-absorbed and to fall right back into bitterness. And uh, sometimes uh, the abuser might have to, they might fall into bitterness uh, right after naming their sin and they might have to name that sin uh, 30, 40 times every five minutes. Well, God is faithful and just and he'll forgive it. And actually, that's why rebound has been given to us as a system not by which we can excuse sin, but a system by which we can get inside the spiritual life. It's God's grace. And if you stay outside of the spiritual life and you say, well, I'm not going to bother God with this again. I'll just stay in bitterness. You'll be a loser and you'll be under more severe punishment. So this is the only thing that will drive out the defense mechanism. And it is a tragedy for anyone who has been abused to react to injustice of child abuse. It's very easy to react to it, but it's a terrible thing for you because what you do is you transfer a piece of that millstone and tie it right around your neck and you'll drown with the abuser unless you stop reacting in bitterness, not only to the one who has abused you, but also toward everyone else because that will be your tendency to react to everyone, to be hypersensitive concerning everything. How dare so-and-so say this about me or how dare so-and-so confront me, etc. And sometimes they need confronting. Sometimes the only way to break through the defense mechanisms is to shock them, as the Lord uses shocking language here. And uh, you can't, uh, and if they don't get it through being shocked into listening to it, they're definitely not going to get it uh, by trying to uh, cozy them up to it. It just doesn't work. Personality's not the issue anyway. The Word of God is, not personality. Personality has never gotten one person on the Word of God. Never. The only thing that gets people on the Word of God is their positive volition. Now, if, if uh, you have a pleasant personality, you might and have the gift of gab, and you might not even have the gift of pastor-teacher, but if you have a pleasant personality and the gift of gab, you might have a church overflowing. But there'll be a bunch of losers. So, uh, in, in most cases. So when you, uh, what happens is uh, you transfer the millstone around your own neck, and therefore, uh, when you go, uh, what you do is react to any type of bad environment, you react to any type of injustice, and you have just allowed the out, outside pressures of adversity to break through into the inside uh, pressure of stress in the soul. And stress in the soul and the spiritual life are mutually exclusive. If you have stress in the soul, you're not spiritual. Period. If you are upset, if you are worried, you're not spiritual. Spirituality is an absolute. You must be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, there is no anxiety. Now, in some cases, the abused person has a strong tendency toward anxiety and must take anti-anxiety medications, and that's fine. Because uh, if you have PTSD, there's no way you can sit here and listen to what I'm saying because every time I would raise my voice, you would uh, go into trauma and be petrified. And uh, it's part of the disorder that has developed. And so they give you Ativan or something else that is non-addictive. Ativan is. But they'll give you something uh, sometimes that's not addictive that helps you out. And you should take it in order to be stabilized enough to understand what's going on. To be grounded in reality. So we can destroy ourselves if we react to the injustices of other people. That goes for the abused person and the non-abused person. But the abused person has a tendency to uh, react to every perceived injustice. Sometimes it's not even an injustice. Sometimes it's perceived that way from their own paranoia. And they think somebody has done them wrong, therefore they have. 
and that person might be the kindest person on the planet if you knew them, and yet uh, they take offense to it. Or And, and especially when you, uh, you get to the Word of God, it's a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. It's two-edged. I watched Braveheart again the other day, and they had two-edged swords. And uh, you just and they would just show it happen. They would just slice it one way, and a man's leg would fly off, and slice it another way, and his head would fly off. Yes, it's a gross movie for the ladies, but I love it. And then, um, so what occurs is this two-edged sword hurts. It hurts. And life is not all full of flowers, especially when it gets to the Word of God. And if I wanted to, I could get up and pass out lilies and bonnets all day, but that's not going to help you grow up spiritually. The only thing that helps you grow up is to uh, learn the Word of God despite the personality, in spite of the personality. And oftentimes, um, well, my pastor had a personality a lot of people probably wouldn't like. I loved it because it was a way that uh, it took away everything. Well, you had to be humble. When you sat in the audience, you had to be humble. You knew who was in charge. You knew that he knew the Word of God. And you knew that you uh, were gonna either going to listen or not. And if you were going to fidget around and not listen, you'd get chewed out. Because uh, he wanted serious students there listening. And they were, for the most part. And uh, that's really the, the best way to teach is with tough love, always. And um, there are, now sometimes uh, one pastor is not everyone else's right pastor. And some people are personality oriented and they go to some uh, uh, mealy person. But if he's giving out the word of God, well, that's fine. It's up to, it's up to you. And uh, I've heard some, not to insult Joe Griffin, I, he's a good pastor, but uh, he's not very forceful. So if you want to hear the Word of God without uh, worrying about being chewed out, well, listen to Joe Griffin. And uh, that will probably occur. I, don't, I haven't heard Bobby chew out too many people as of yet, but hes I think he's getting to the point where he knows he has to. At least that's what I've heard recently uh, from those who have listened and have filled me in on it. Uh, because uh, people in a church have a tendency to run over authority, always, especially the women. That's why it says in the Bible, women keep silent in church. Because if they see a weak sister in the pulpit, they're going to slam right over him with a steamroller. And just like they did with poor old Timothy. And he was a nice fellow who was giving the word of God, but uh, then the, the, Paul had to tell him, hey man, have some wine for your stomach's sake. You're all tore up. He was. He was full of anxiety. And uh, if they had had the medicine, uh, the Apostle Paul would have handed him a Xanax or an Ativan or something, or a Valium. Like they used to use those a lot in the 70s. And that's probably what he would have done. Have this Valium and then now go chew them out. So Galatians 6-7. <laughs> do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. This is the principle that goes for the child abuser. And they will reap it. And they will uh, have a traumatic life. The same, tra the same traumatic experiences that they put on the helpless child will come back to haunt them. And they'll have a traumatic life. Not only on the earth, but if they're unbelievers, they'll have trauma for eternity. So the survivor of child abuse, therefore, exists in two categories that we've already studied. There's no in-between. They either go with doctrine or they go with the defense mechanisms because they develop so early in life, they're either going to get with the Word of God or they're going to stick with the defense mechanisms. Most stick with the defense mechanisms, but that's not shocking because uh, most people stick with reversionism even if they haven't been abused. So it is a matter of volition. The second category are those who go the full route of the spiritual life by using the ten problem-solving devices instead of the defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms are defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the third edition revised, page 393 through 394, as this. Defense mechanisms defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Defense mechanisms are patterns of feelings. Defense mechanisms are patterns of feelings, thoughts, or behaviors that are relatively involuntary and arise in response to perceptions of psychic danger. 
They are designed to hide or alleviate the conflicts or stressors that give rise to anxiety. Defense mechanisms are patterns of feelings, thoughts, or behaviors that are relatively involuntary. Especially if you're a child, they're involuntary. It's what it's God's system that he gave to you to handle a trauma traumatic experience. So it's involuntary, it just automatically occurs when the abuse occurs. That are relatively involuntary and arise in response to perceptions of psychic danger. They are designed to hide or alleviate the conflicts or stressors that give rise to anxiety. That's why I put it on the other side of the faith rest drill. What's the faith rest drill designed for us as believers to do? To keep stress out of the life, to keep anxiety out. And when times get bad, what do you do? Claim a promise, mix it with faith. When someone insults you, you leave them in the Supreme Court of Heaven. That's the fourth stage. That is your problem-solving device. But as a child, you have no way to know the faith rest drill, so instead you repress it uh, through a defense mechanism or dissociate or something else. So it is a means by which the child can uh, alleviate anxiety or keep it on the outside where anxiety should be. We have the unique spiritual life to keep stress on the outside and uh, the young child who has been abused has the defense mechanisms to keep stress on the outside or anxiety on the outside. They don't keep it all out there because we note all the problems that occur. Dissociation is a perfect example of using a defense mechanism. And when the customary feelings of one's own reality is lost through child abuse, you actually split from reality, the person replaces these feelings with feelings of unreality. This is also called uh, depersonalization disorder. And some abused children, you would think, are the uh, cruelest people on the planet when they become older because uh, they actually uh, depersonalize uh, well, they're hypersensitive concerning self, insensitive toward others. That's the best way to describe it. They're so insensitive toward others that they've depersonalized it. And you would say, that person is just cold. What a cold-hearted person. And we've all known people like that. Sometimes it's related to the fact that they've been abused and they've depersonalized it. And they don't really consider themselves to be that cruel whatsoever. Yet everyone else in the world is cruel to them, but uh, they're not cruel to anyone. They've depersonalized it. So you stop uh, feeling those uh, feelings that hurt you in the case of dissociation. You've lost touch with the rest of the human race, and now you really don't care how other people feel. You lose your natural compassion, really. Yeah, and it is an, almost a natural thing that develops, and you lose it. No compassion. Like the, the, the authorities that kick the dog off the bus uh, of the uh, little children trying to get out of the Astro or the Superdome. And just, that's just cold-hearted. That person must have some depersonalization going on. That's, not just, that's just not even normal. You have a loss of compassion. You have lost your consideration toward others. You've become cold and cruel toward others, and uh, you do not even equate this with harshness. This cold attitude or this cruelty as being wrong. You don't even consider it wrong. It's just... Uh, You've depersonalized it. That's who you are. And if you're married to a person who uh, depersonalizes, you're up the creek. It's going to be rough because uh, they're going to treat you with all the cruelty in the world, and uh, they, they'll think it's normal. It's it's okay to be this cold. It's okay to be this harsh. It's just the way they are. They think to themselves, and they don't even think of it as being cold. But as soon as you do something that uh, affects their hypersensitivity, they'll jump all over you. In other words, these people can dish it out, but they can't take it. They can dish out insults and cold-heartedness all the time, and then uh, you say one thing in response, and then comes the silent treatment all day long or whatever. And uh, it's, it would be very difficult to be married to someone like this. But it can happen through the unique spiritual life because uh, when you grow in grace and in knowledge, even if you're married to an abused person, you learn these things and then you learn impersonal love so that uh, while they're nuts, uh, you have plus eight sharing the happiness of God. 
And you can't just hop out of the marriage. You jumped in it knowing these things probably. Uh, you didn't know it to this extent or you wouldn't have done it. So in denial, you fail to acknowledge some aspects of external reality that would be apparent to others very apparent to others. Your perception of reality is gone and is replaced with things that have happened to you. It's very self-absorbed. Denial plus depersonalization means you will never have an extensive, intimate relationship with anyone in friendship or in marriage. It's impossible for someone functioning under the defense mechanisms to have this. They've depersonalized everything and um, the marriage is going to suffer and they, they, they'll have trouble being intimate. And you know that by all the movies that are out when uh, a man usually marries a woman who's been abused and she has trouble being intimate in the marriage, has trouble with the sexual relationship, has trouble with uh, other things because she's depersonalized and she's just incapable of intimate relationship. But you married her, so you got to stick it out and stick with it. And maybe, uh, through God's grace and her positive volition, she'll overcome these things. What, what has happened in this, uh, the reason why you will not have an intimate relationship is because, because you've lost your very feelings of sensitivity that you had when you were under the abuse. You, usually uh, children already have uh, sensitivity, but then when they're abused, they lose that sensitivity. That's why they go out bashing their dog's head in or killing their cat, etc. And you have replaced those feelings with uh, those feelings and sensitivity with things that uh, produce the scar tissue in the soul, uh, i.e., mostly bitterness completely bitter, self-absorbed, and uh, very uh, hypersensitive concerning self, but very insensitive concerning others. An abused person who has not learned the problem-solving devices will fail in marriage, and then they'll blame the other person for the failure in marriage. And that often occurs. It's their fault. Always it's the other person's fault. Usually it goes both ways. Even though they are the ones who have lost all of their natural compassion, their natural consideration, it's still the other person's fault. Even though they're the ones who are insensitive, even though they're the ones who are hypersensitive, it's always the other person's fault. And that's why counseling is a joke. People go into counseling so that uh, they can get the counselor to side with one or the other. It's a joke. And in some cases, oh, this happens all the time. The uh, man and woman will go into marriage counseling. The woman's attractive and the man is a, is a, a psychologist but a pervert. And therefore, he seeks to uh, seduce the woman. And the woman is easy, easily seduced because she is a responder. And she begins to transfer her respect from her husband to the one in the session. And therefore, she's going to be the one that's always right. And the, uh, the paramour or the... Uh, whatever you call them, will be uh, seeking uh, to, uh, to have relations with her, and therefore, uh, it's a joke. Counseling's a joke. You get your best counseling from the Word of God, and you can't get it from... And, and what really makes me scratch my head is believers going to counselors, to counselors who are unbelievers. Well, how in the world are they going to give you anything with the problem-solving devices? And in some cases, uh, some Christians have recognized that and said, well, I'll just go to a Christian counselor. And then all they do is gossip all day long. And it's really, marriage is designed for privacy. It's not designed for you to run around and air your problems to the world. Marriage is designed for privacy. And most Americans don't understand that because I've been around the world and been in the workplace and all the little ladies talk about their husbands all day long and air out their laundry all day long. No privacy. No privacy in the marriage. The marriage is an institution. And just as you as a person must have privacy, so should you and the institution of marriage have privacy. You're only destroying your marriage when you uh, run around and talk about the other partner, male or female, and both do it, of course. And so, uh, I'll get into this deeper in the marriage series. So, 
what happens is uh, the victim of child abuse loses their compassion, their natural consideration, and therefore uh, they fail in marriage. And that's because they haven't taken up the ten problem-solving devices, and one of the ways to do this is to forget or disregard those things that are behind and press onward toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forget it! Well, you will never forget it, but disregard it, throw it in the sea, and let God deal with them, and let God, through his grace, allow you to develop the ten problem-solving devices so that you can grow up spiritually and finally have a stable, happy life. And then you can recover, and then some of those com those uh, compassions come back, and the consideration for others comes back, because it's spiritual. And uh, we'll note that God, the Holy Spirit, uh, there's a lot of production from the Spirit, and a, a lot of it deals with love, both uh, impersonal love. And remember, the man is not only commanded to have impersonal love for his wife, but personal. I got in an argument one time with uh, somebody who said, no, it's just impersonal love. Well, they didn't know what they were talking about, and I do. Because it says in the Bible that the man must love his wife as Christ loved the church. How does Christ love the church? Phileo, personal love. And also, while he was on the cross, he used a lot of impersonal love. So the husband must have both. The woman must have impersonal love. Do you know the woman is never ever commanded in the Bible to love her husband? I've never seen it. It's not there. She's commanded to respect now there is a verse that says uh, there's a, a lady, there are certain ladies who have the spiritual gift to teach other women how to love their husband and their children. One of the strangest verses I've ever noticed in the Bible, but it's true. And that's because they're responders and they must have respect as their highest form of love. And so really the woman, uh, when the man says I love you, really the woman should say I respect you. But don't do that. That would make you a bit weird. But it, just in terms of principle and understanding that there's a difference there. So the abused person functioning under the defense mechanisms is extremely sensitive to the flaws and failures of others in personal relationships, such as marriage. But they are totally insensitive to your own flaws and failures. The abused person functioning under the defense mechanisms is extremely sensitive to the flaws and failures of others in their personal relationships, such as marriage, but they are totally insensitive to your own flaws and failures. Yeah. In other words, you screw up once, they're insensitive toward you. They can screw up all day long and it doesn't matter, you just gotta put up with it. It's part of the cold-heartedness factor that comes out of abuse. In fact, uh, the person who has been abused using defense mechanisms, usually uh, that you, they see their very own flaws and failures in the other person, and that's called projection. They see their very own flaws and failures in the other person, but they don't see these flaws in themselves. This is called projection. It's a defense mechanism in childhood that has been carried over into adulthood. Therefore, you must learn the ten problem-solving devices to kick these things out of your stream of consciousness. Because if you project all day long, you'll never rebound. You're always right. And that's because uh, you really aren't cruel. The other person's cruel. That's how you think. I'm not the one that's cold-hearted. The other person is cold-hearted. And there's a great deal of projection. And you use projection instead of rebound. So up there at number one with self-justification and self-deception, projection can go right along with that because you project instead of rebound. You project your flaws, your sins onto others. And if you've never been around people like that, you might not understand it, but I guarantee you they exist. People, they, they are. You've probably been around them because it's very prevalent today that they project all the time. And psychologists have often uh, come to the conclusion that if a man has never really been jealous through the marriage and then suddenly in the seventh, eight year of marriage becomes very jealous and possessive of his wife, that it's because he's projecting his own adultery and he's the one been screwing around. Now that's not the, in, true in all cases, but that's how psychology uh, describes projection in some ways. And it does occur, but uh, if your husband has suddenly become jealous, don't think he's out cheating on you. Uh, maybe he's seeing something that you're not, or maybe he's just sinning for a while until he gets back into fellowship. 
So uh, the believer who survives, who that is the believer who has been abused and survives, rejects Bible doctrine and the spiritual dynamics. Therefore, there is no clearing out of the soul garbage. Therefore, they live their whole lives under the defense mechanism. And unbelievers who live their life through the use of the defense mechanisms will never have true happiness in life. And all they can do in life is accept all the cheap substitutes. And that's why oftentimes the abused child will go off the deep end in lasciviousness. It's a cheap substitute for they can't be happy, so they go out and uh, fornicate, get drunk, get hooked on drugs, etc. That is their happiness. That is their cheap substitute, and it is a cheap substitute compared to the unique spiritual life. So without eternal life through faith in Christ, there is no solution to the tragedies and great sorrows that overtake the human race. And this is called in the Bible the veil of tears. And the unbeliever who has been abused, the only thing they have to look forward to if they never believe in Christ is a veil of tears their whole life and then a veil of tears and gnashing of teeth for eternity. And you say, that's not fair. God is fair. Don't ever question God. It is fair. They still made the choice to reject Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not reject them. Jesus Christ invites us to believe. Jesus Christ did not reject them. So, those who survive with God's help, and by the way, this inviting Christ into the heart bit, if you could do it, that means he could reject you. If you're the one doing the inviting, then it's just it's convoluted. The way people, they, well, they have no doctrine, and that's why they go that way. There's a bunch of newly saved people thinking that uh, they know the gospel, and they go out and make up these ridiculous substitutes for the gospel, which are satanic and cloud the way of salvation, always. So those who survive with God's help, that is, with the unique spiritual life, develop temporal solutions to the tragedies of life through the development of the ten problem-solving devices and through post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation, and therefore they develop a thirst and a love for doctrine. Oftentimes the abused person uh, who finally latches on to the ten problem-solving devices, they develop a thirst and a love for doctrine because it's their only solution and they know it. And it's all of us. It's, a, it's the solution for all of us. It's the solution for this country. And if just one extra person, two, three extra people were to take this more seriously and get growing in the spiritual life, maybe the country would be turned around or at least given a few more years. I don't think uh, some of you, I don't think some of you understand the impact that you can have from your spiritual life. It's phenomenal. And uh, it takes a while to get there, and then when you see it happening all around you, and uh, you see it from experience, then maybe it becomes more real to you then. But it's always been real to me. This is the solution. This is the answer, and this is the answer not only for you individually, but the answer for this country. And you've got to uh, be, love the Word of God. We eat every day. We should be fed the manna of the Word every day. That's why I'm here every day except Saturday and twice on Sunday so that you, you can get your daily portion of the Word. It's that important. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's the Word of God that is way more important. It's even more important than physical food. That's the indication although physical food is very important and we don't support fasting or any of that nonsense. Those who survive with God's help, of course, use the temporal solutions of the ten problem-solving devices, the three spiritual skills, four spiritual mechanics, two power options, all of those things that we've been given at the point, actually, of salvation. We've been given a portfolio of invisible assets and therefore we learn about these things and grow in grace and in knowledge. Therefore, you must have cognition of of the Word of God and inculcation of the problem-solving devices. And by now, some of you should be about able to know the first ten problem-solving devices. And if you don't, don't worry about it, but uh, by now we've been over it enough that that's inculcation enough to where you'll probably be able to remember it in a tight spot. Like the guy said in the movie, I'm in a tight spot. So they are never, that's, oh brother, where art thou, by the way, it's funny. 
So they are never handicapped by the past and have the glorious future that God intended for every believer in both time, or for every believer for both time and eternity. Again, we are never uh, we are never to be handicapped by the past. I wasn't too clear on it. I'll say it clearer. They are never handy. You should never be handicapped by the past and therefore fail to have the glorious future that God has intended for every believer both in time and in eternity. Remember, all of us one day are going to be evaluated. Sometimes we might forget about it. Sometimes we probably w uh, should forget about it or otherwise we would be terrified. But one day we're going to be evaluated by Jesus Christ himself. And he is, as it were, going to say, what did you do with the unique spiritual life? It was available to you, and what'd you do with it? And uh, if you if you uh, stutter around and don't know or don't even have a clue, well, you're a loser, and you do not receive eternal rewards. But God has designed it so that all of us as believers should receive all of our rewards. We all start out with equal privilege and equal opportunity. Even the abused person starts out with equal privilege and equal opportunity. So there's never an excuse, never an excuse, and nobody, none of us, will have an excuse when we're at the Bema, the evaluation throne. It'll be no excuses, sir. He'll be the drill sergeant. He fulfilled the prototype. Why didn't you fulfill the protocol? And the only thing is no excuses. I should have. And you'll be happy in heaven, but at the same time, at that moment, you will experience the greatest oxymoron ever in human or in angelic history, and that is uh, having shame in a resurrection body. Therefore, you, sh you are never handicapped. You should never think of yourself as handicapped because we all have equal privilege and equal opportunity to execute the protocol plan of God. Tomorrow night we'll start with Matthew chapter 18 verses 8 through 9. And this is a warning to the unbeliever who is a child abuser. There are warnings to the unbeliever and there is a warning to the believer as well. Matthew 18, 8 through 9 is a warning to the unbeliever who is the child abuser. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we can come to understand the importance of the Word and come to understand that the only answer for any problem in life is through the wonderful system of grace that you have provided for us in the ten problem-solving devices, in those spiritual skills, in the two power options. This is the only, uh, the only way any of us can overcome the obstacles in life. And we understand that, and we know that we must have a fire in our bones when it comes to learning these things, so that not only we can uh, be uh, glorious winners in the future, but so that also we can deliver our country whose levies are breaking. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.